Now, from CBS News Miami, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Welcome to Facing South Florida. I'm Jim DeFeedy. Catherine Fernandez Rundle has been the state attorney in Miami Dade County for more than 30 years. She was first appointed in 1993 after President Bill Clinton named Janet Reno Attorney General. Since then, Rundle has won re election seven times, and if no one files to run against her in the next two weeks, the 74 year old state attorney will automatically be re elected to another four year term. In her 31 years in office, Rundle is credited with creating the state's first domestic violence court, as well as specialty courts to focus on people with drug addictions and veterans suffering from mental health issues. She also created a human trafficking task force. But her tenure has not been without controversy. She has never, in three decades, filed charges against a police officer for shooting and killing someone on duty even though there have been numerous questionable police shootings. In fact, following a 2013 investigation, the U.S. Justice Department said Miami police officers engage in a pattern or practice of excessive use of force through officer-involved shootings in violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. And yet not a single officer has ever been held accountable by Rundle, not one. Then there was the case of Darren Rainey, a 50-year-old mentally ill prisoner in South Dade who was locked in a shower room by prison guards who then allegedly tortured Rainey by leaving him under scalding hot water for nearly two hours before he collapsed and died. Documents released by the state attorney's office, including witness statements and medical records, told a tale of horrors. A nurse at the facility told investigators that burns covered 90% of Rainey's body and that his temperature was too high to register on a thermometer. Guards described how Rainey's skin peeled off his body when they moved him. Five years after the incident, however, Rundle closed the investigation without charges, saying the autopsy determined Rainey's death was an accident caused by complications from schizophrenia, heart disease, and confinement to a shower. Now, I invited Rundle to come on the show and discuss her record as state attorney, but she declined. Nevertheless, Rundle has always defended the decisions made by her office by arguing her and her prosecutors can be trusted to do what is right and follow the law wherever it leads. Here she is in a promotional video last year. Our aim is always to balance our core values of enforcing the law as ministers of justice while acting with fairness and integrity in our search for the truth. And this was what she said during an interview a few years earlier with Miami Today. One of our very strong philosophies as an office, which may be, uh, it may be a little uncommon for others, is our emphasis is on a just result. Not on how many convictions, not how many bars of convictions you have on your record, many trials you've tried, but well, what is a just result? And that's always what we really strive for. A recent case, however, cast doubt on that claim by Rundle. Rundle's office was seeking the death penalty against Corey Smith, the notorious leader of the violent street gang from the 90s known as the John Doe's. Smith had previously been sentenced to death for two murders, but the state Supreme Court ordered a new sentencing hearing. It should have been a straightforward affair. But last month, something stunning happened. On the eve of resentencing, after a lengthy hearing, a Miami-Dade judge disqualified two of Rundle's top prosecutors, accusing them in a written order of misconduct and alleging they were manipulating witness testimony in a death penalty case. Rundle's office denied it did anything wrong, but during the hearing, it was revealed that Rundle's office would allegedly bring prisoners who would testify in their cases to the Miami Police Department to coordinate their stories before going to court, allegedly rewarding them with food, alcohol, and wait for it, the ability to have sex with their girlfriends in the police department's interview rooms. Now, uh, some of this alleged misconduct took place 20 years ago, but some of it is very recent. I want you to listen to this recording from 2022. It is a phone call between Michael Von Zamt, one of Rundle's most senior and trusted prosecutors, and Latravis Galashaw, a convicted killer who is going to testify for Von Zamt at the resentencing hearing for Corey Smith. 
During the phone call, Von Zamft expressed concern that some of his other witnesses have changed their stories, including another gang member, Demetrius Jones, whose street name was Meathead. And you, and you don't know about rehabilitating Jones, huh? Which one? Jones, the, the Meathead. Yeah. His problem is, well, Jones, I told you, his contradictory statements. Now, I've tried to, I've asked them to allow you, Jones, and Brown to go to the, you know, courtyard together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've asked them to do that, but Corrections has not agreed. Oh. Let's be clear about what is happening. The prosecutor is saying he is trying to get Galishaw into the prison courtyard with two other witnesses so the convicted killer could work out any differences in their testimony. Von Zamp told the court that he was trying to orchestrate Jones and Brown meeting in the courtyard for safety reasons, an argument the judge rejected as specious. And when the Department of Corrections refused to put them in the courtyard together, Von Zamp said he was working on having someone else call Corrections to try to make this happen. Judge Andrea Wilson, a respected former prosecutor herself, described this phone call as a smoking gun for prosecutorial misconduct. During the same call, Von Zamp described a problem with another witness. If I call her and she refuses, then I will find a way to make her unavailable, and then I can read her whole testimony. I will find a way to make her unavailable. That's what he said. In other words, if she doesn't testify in a way that helps the state attorney, then he will find a way to make sure she doesn't make it to court. He would find a way to make her unavailable so she couldn't potentially help the defense. And as Judge Wolfson noted, Galishaw wasn't just a convicted murderer. He was a convicted murderer in a case that involves witness elimination. Mr. Von Zamft, a highly trained lawyer, knew who he was talking to, Judge Wolfson wrote. At best, Mr. Von Zamft's use of the words, make her unavailable, is reckless considering the audience. To be clear, this court does not believe that Mr. Von Zamft was sending a cryptic message to Mr. Galishaw to eliminate the witness. However, reasonable minds may reach a different conclusion based on the totality of the circumstances in this case. Think about what Judge Wilson is saying. The fact that it is even a possibility that reasonable minds might think that one of Rundle's prosecutors may have wanted a problematic witness killed is terrifying. Corey Smith's attorneys asked that Rundle's entire office be disqualified from handling the case. Judge Wilson refused to remove the entire office and instead remove Von Zamft and another prosecutor, Stephen Mitchell, writing, the prosecutors in this case have lost sight of their responsibility and justice demands their disqualification. Shortly after the judge issued her order, Von Zamft resigned from the state attorney's office. Neither he nor Mitchell could be reached for comment. Rundle refused to comment on the case as well, saying in a written statement, it is inappropriate to comment further on pending litigation. The evidentiary hearing is ongoing. I recently spoke to the two defense attorneys who uncovered this smoking gun phone call, Craig Wisenhunt and Allison Miller. So I think what's concerning about this is that all of these things came to light, not in a vacuum. There were a number of chief assistants and mine attorneys from the state attorney's office gathered in our courtroom during the course of this hearing. There were quite a few more who were watching these events unfold in real time via Zoom. And yet none of them ever took the position of, this is wrong, we should put a stop to this. Um, we've come to learn even more recently that the representation that had been repeatedly made to us that all of the discovery in this case had long been lost or destroyed was not only untrue, but that quite a lot of it had been digitally scanned in. And in fact, the team of state attorneys in the room had a paralegal whose only job and purpose of being there was to assist them with finding things within this digital record. And the fact that nobody saw the conduct that we were witnessing as being problematic reflects that that office doesn't see this as being problematic. And you shouldn't be able to look at these facts and not come away with it a sense of this is wrong. We're here to seek the truth, to find justice, and instead it has become a win at all cost analysis for that office, and they've lost sight of what is important. And the only way you change that, especially as entrenched as those views are now, is that it requires a fundamental change of leadership. And it's 
representative of a complete failure of the existing leadership to properly guide that office. I can't tell you how many people, and Craig can attest to this as well, reached out to us um, from Miami-Dade County once we had filed these motions, um, the motion to disqualify the state attorney's office and the motion to vacate Mr. Smith's convictions to lend help. Um, obviously, Craig and I don't routinely practice in Miami, and it wasn't just the private defense bar, public defenders, current prosecutors, former prosecutors. I mean, <laughs> I felt like I was getting five to 10 calls a day where somebody wanted to tell me something about Michael von Zamft or Stephen Mitchell or the state attorney's office. It isn't limited just to the singular odd instances. There seems to be a greater pattern of either misconduct or culture within that office. And Ms. Rundle is either complicit in that culture or corruption, or she's incompetent. And you really can't distill it to either any other option. She either knows what's going on and is okay with it, or she is so out of touch with the behavior of that office that she shouldn't be in a position of leadership there. The Florida Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys has called on Rondo to create a conviction integrity unit, a group of attorneys who could review cases to look for misconduct. Rondo has refused and said she will conduct her own internal review. If she's truly committed to this transparency that she's claiming, then the best way to achieve that would not be to have somebody in-house do this. It would be to contract to someone disinterested who can look at it critically and assess, did they go wrong? But here, where we already have a, a crisis of confidence in that office's ability to self-govern and comport themselves professionally and ethically, why on earth should we hold any confidence in their own ability now, suddenly, to recognize right versus wrong, when every piece of evidence we have so far is that their moral compass is astray. Now, I realize some of you may say to yourself, so her office may have violated the rights of a convicted murderer. And it's unlikely there are many people who will shed a tear for Corey Smith. But what if that misconduct leads to him being released? But again, if you don't care what Rundle's office did to Corey Smith, then what about a 15-year-old boy who she indicted for murder that turned out to be innocent? When we come back, we'll talk about the murder of Rabbi Joseph Raxon and why that rabbi's family might never get the justice they deserve because of how this case was handled. Stay with us. Welcome back. We have been reviewing the record of Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle, who has been in office for more than three decades. She is up for re-election this year, and if no one files to run against her in the next two weeks, the 74-year-old will automatically be re-elected to another four-year term. Now, there are a lot of cases we could have and probably should talk about, including whether she has done enough in prosecuting public corruption cases during her time in office. But there is one case that deserves more scrutiny, the murder investigation of Rabbi Joseph Raxon and her decision to indict a 15-year-old with the rabbi's murder. Here is the news story from the press conference Rundle held the day the 15-year-old, DeAndre Charles, was arrested in December 2015, more than 16 months after the murder. This is the face of a beloved father, grandfather, and rabbi taken too soon, Joseph Raxon. Miami-Dade investigators announced Wednesday for the first time that this is the face of the person who murdered him, teenager DeAndre Charles. His murder at the hands of the thugs has caused an emptiness and a void that cannot be replaced. Raxon's daughter waited more than a year for the news that police made an arrest in the case. We want this vicious thug to be prosecuted to the fullest extent the law allows. Miami-Dade police say DeAndre Charles, just 14 at the time, fired the fatal shot during a botched robbery on a Saturday in August 2014 as Raxon walked to a synagogue. The killer got nothing from Raxon, prosecutors say, because Orthodox Jews are forbidden from carrying money during the Sabbath. State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle says Charles shot Raxon in the chest with a semi-automatic handgun. It was mean, cold, and he didn't have any money on him, so he shot and killed him. Just as sad as that. The only problem? He didn't do it. And nearly a year later, in January 2017, shortly after Rundle won re-election, prosecutors dropped the charges against DeAndre Charles.
Again, I invited Rundle to come on the show to discuss her record and specifically this case, but she refused. She did send me this statement. When we received new evidence that the defendant may have been innocent, we immediately dropped the case. That is the sum and total of what she had to say about this case. But according to James DeMiles, DeAndre Charles's attorney, Rundle's statement is misleading and disingenuous. Prosecutors had the evidence they needed to know DeAndre wasn't responsible from the beginning. This is how he responded when I asked him if prosecutors knew or should have known DeAndre was innocent when they indicted him. Knew or should have known uh, would give them the benefit of the doubt here, Jim. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, I think miscarriage of justice and what is the extent of the cover-up is the better way to look at it. As the Miami Herald reported in 2016, police had a statement from the driver of the getaway car who identified the two men responsible for the murder. The driver even noted when one of the two men jumped in the car after the shooting, the man said, I just bagged a Jew. I think I'm going to get caught for it. You will see that all of the information that was relied upon to get this case dismissed after DeAndre had served 11 months in jail was known to the Miami-Dade County State Attorney's Office before they ever indicted DeAndre. The question is, why? Why, if they knew this information, did they indict DeAndre? DeMiles has been investigating what really happened for years. In 2019, he filed a federal lawsuit against the county on behalf of DeAndre. But the case was dismissed by a judge who ruled that police and prosecutors have sovereign immunity for making honest mistakes. But DeMille says he has discovered thousands of pages of never before seen records, including records that had been sealed for years. He is now working on filing a new lawsuit, which will argue the indictment of DeAndre was not an innocent mistake. And he noted the misconduct by prosecutors in the Corey Smith case is eerily similar to the misconduct he claims to have uncovered in DeAndre's case. He says there may well be a reason why that's true. It's the same prosecutor. As you can see here, when Catherine Fernandez Rundle held her press conference calling 15-year-old DeAndre a cold and mean killer, standing directly behind her was the lead prosecutor on the case, Michael Von Zamt. Von Zamt resigned from the state attorney's office last month and could not be reached for comment. Rundle did not respond to written questions about whether Von Zamt's conduct in the Rabbi Raxon murder case was under review. DeMiles told me that because of the way Rundle's office has handled this case, he believes it is highly unlikely anyone will be held responsible for Rabbi Raxon's murder. Well, I hope for the family of Rabbi Raxon that this case is solved. Unfortunately, um, I'm not sure that, um, that it can be solved without getting into too much. Uh, well, let me correct that. Murder has been solved. I'm just not sure that it can be proven any longer because of the actions of Michael Montana and what they did here. And of course, there is the fact that a 15 year old spent nearly a year in jail wrongly accused of murder. You're a father. Talk to me about the idea of, you know, if your son was 14 and arrested on a murder charge that you believe prosecutors knew he didn't commit. Just talk to me about that. What do you think that does? What do you think that that effect that has had on DeAndre? You know, <clears throat> Jim, I get emotional every time I talk about this because of that reason. My heart breaks for him. And I mentioned I don't do I did high level criminal defense for years. I'm a former state prosecutor of the highest level. I'm death penalty certified. I don't do any criminal defense anymore, but I will never give up on this case. I don't think we've heard the last of this case or how Rundo and her office handled it. When we come back, two major decisions this week from the state Supreme Court on abortion. We'll dig into what it all means when we return. Stay with us.
Welcome back. On Monday, April 1st, the Florida Supreme Court said the state privacy provision of the state constitution does not protect a woman's right to have an abortion. Because of that ruling, the state's six-week abortion ban will kick into effect on May 1st. But the court also agreed to allow a constitutional amendment protecting abortion in Florida to be on the ballot in November. After the ruling, I spoke to Democratic State Senator Lauren Book about what it all means. Look, I think these were huge, huge decisions. We were expecting um, the ballot decision to come down. Um, I think a little surprised that they were, they also coupled that with the 15 week ban. And I wanna break it down for your viewers, Jim. What this means, there are two things. One, that come November, abortion is gonna be on the ballot and people will be able to decide um, what is the fate of women and freedom, really medical freedom in our state. Um, but I think that people have lost sight in some of, of the stuff that has come down since Monday. We've gotten a lot of calls into our office. People are confused. So right now, we still live in a 15-week ban state. Um, you have 30 days. So at the end of the month, the six-week ban will kick into effect. And so I want all of your viewers who may have appointments or be afraid or finding out right now that they're pregnant and they're a certain point in their pregnancy, keep your appointments. Call your medical providers. We have a lot of confusion out there um, because they don't know what this means. Um, but come May 1st, we will live in a state where it, we, we will have basically an all-out ban on abortion. Um, and that is scary. That's scary for women. So the landscape is um, one where we've got um, an immediate uh, ban coming uh, at the end of the month, but really looking forward to November to fight to make sure that people show up um, and support the um, initiative, Amendment 4, voting yes to make sure that people have reproductive freedom and reproductive health care rights in our state. You know, I almost respect the court for what it did. They took away the rights of women, but at the same time said, okay, if you don't like it, vote for it and get it back in the Constitution. I think that that's, you're 100% correct. Those things didn't have to happen um, at the same time. But I do think that we are living in a landscape where we were reading the tea leaves and, and sort of knew where they were going on the 15-week ban um, and felt confident really about the, here, the oral arguments related to um, Amendment 4. And to your point, Jim, and we've talked about this at length, People are now going to see a very real reality in our state about what will happen um, in an all-out ban um, when it comes to women's reproductive health care. It's not hyperbole. We've seen the stories of women who are being sent to their car to develop sepsis-like symptoms um, so that they can get appropriate health care, so that they can terminate a pregnancy once they're past 15 weeks. That will happen more and more frequently. And again, I, I think people want to make this partisan, and it's not. As we were collecting petitions, throughout the off time um, and over the summer, we were going into Republican areas of the state. We were talking to independents. This is an issue that cuts across politics. Well, it's a highly political issue. Let's not make no, make no mistake about it. There are people across the board support this initiative. We know that to be true. We're going to work to make sure that 60 plus 1% come out. But I do think that while this is a very scary time for women in our state, a, a horrifically scary time, um, that that lays in stark contrast to why people need to show up in November to protect those rights. And at the same time, I find it very interesting that two of those justices um, will be on the ballot for retention. Those who um, were supportive of the 15-week ban, um, which is going to move the six-week ban into place. So I think that these are very interesting uh, things that will come before the voters. The next seven months will define Florida for a very long time. Well, that's all the time we have for today. If you want to share your thoughts, you can email me at jdefeaty at cbs.com. We'll be back again next week. Enjoy the rest of your day.